Welcome to the Monticello live stream. My name is John Ragasta. I'm a historian here at the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies in Monticello. And it's my pleasure today to be here with Bill Barker, who many of you will know as Thomas Jefferson. Bill is our historic interpreter. He often plays the role of Thomas Jefferson here on the mountain. But today we have him in his normal 21st century persona. And the topic today is going to be Thomas Jefferson and Judicial Review, and specifically the case of Marbury versus Madison. Now that's interesting because there's very few Supreme Court cases that most people are familiar with, but people have sort of heard of Marbury versus Madison. And the idea, which is embedded in that case, that the Supreme Court, the judiciary, can review acts of Congress or acts of the executive and declare them unconstitutional and obviously enormous implications to that power of judicial review. And Bill and I are gonna be talking about that today. So let me get right into it. Bill, you know, I, I allude to the fact that this is sort of an interesting topic from a public perspective. And you've been uh, acting as Thomas Jefferson now, I think for well over 35 years, is that right? Uh, I shouldn't say that maybe online, but <laughs> for a number of years. Is this a topic that people are aware of or talk about or ask you about? Uh, indeed it is, John. Uh, and throughout the years, uh, when I was interpreting Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia, and then later on for 27 years in Colonial Williamsburg, uh, let alone here at, at uh, his home at our Monticello, uh, yes, the idea of judicial review, what it implies, and particularly uh, the case Madison versus Marbury comes up. Now, does it come up consistently and frequently? I would not say so, but it does come up because there are those who are well acquainted with our nation's history, who are well acquainted with uh, the history of Thomas Jefferson and let alone the history of John Marshall, his cousin, uh, who will bring this up and they'll want to hear, uh, once again, if they already know Mr. Jefferson's opinion, uh, or they want to hear it clarified and understand it better. So I would say that it has actually come up more at, uh, at Monticello uh, simply because a, a number of folks from around the world interested in Thomas Jefferson are going to come here directly to learn more about him. And if they've heard about uh, Madison versus Marbury, if they heard about uh, his lifelong more than acquaintance relationship with Chief Justice John Marshall, this is where they're going to ask it. So now, John, I'm curious with respect to judicial review, whether for the revolutionary Jefferson, is this idea so revolutionary? I mean, how long is this, has it existed? Uh, how has it come up uh, in our young nation? And what is it all about, judicial review? Well, that's one of the things that's interesting about this case in the context of Monticello and Thomas Jefferson. Because we're all familiar that Jefferson is unhappy with the decision in the case, the specific decision. And, and we'll come back to that maybe. But the idea of judicial review is long standing. I mean, it goes back to the early 17th century, and it was very much a, a process which was to constrain the king. So it's a liberty loving idea. And when you go back to the Constitutional Convention, you have Thomas Jefferson talking about judicial review and letters to James Madison, James Madison defending judicial review. Thomas Jefferson says to Madison, we need a bill of rights so that the Supreme Court can strike down congressional laws that interfere with people's rights. Patrick Henry during the ratification debates, judicial review, John Marshall in the ratification debates. So the idea that the court is going to be engaged in judicial review is an old idea, and it's one that Jefferson and Madison specifically endorsed, especially in the context of the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. But then that leads to, okay, so why are they so upset in this case? And what, what is it about this case that, that um, affects them? And I think there's a couple of things going on. First, um, Jefferson is very unhappy with the Federalist Judiciary Act, the midnight appointments that right before, after he's been elected, everybody knows he's gonna be president, but before he can take office, the Federalist Congress and John Adams president, Federalist president, sign a law creating all these new judgeships and they appoint all these judges, they appoint all these new officers. Jefferson says to Abigail Adams, this is the one thing he can't forgive John Adams. Mm -hmm. You know, that He's appointing people for my administration. So, so you got that background. 
Then the second background you've got, and you allude to it, and I want to come back to it, is Thomas Jefferson's relationship with John Marshall. Oh, he just dislikes John Marshall. So if Marshall says it, there's going to be a problem. But then you have this, the courts declared judicial review. And as I said, Jefferson himself had endorsed it. But when it comes out in Marbury versus Madison, I think that he dimly sees how it can expand. He'd already endorsed the concept because he says, we need that to prevent Congress from violating people's individual rights. But it may be that when Marshall talks about it, Marbury versus Madison, he starts to see this concept could be more expansive than we've thought when we said we want judicial review. Now, maybe that leads to another question, which is you, you said that people are interested. People talk about, are you, have you seen a change over time? Are people thinking more about this today than maybe they were 10 years ago? Well, I, I think particularly over the last several years when we've seen so many appointments uh, to the Supreme Court, and particularly uh, the result uh, of those appointments that have come out over the last several months, that the, the subject of, uh, of where this fits in our nation's history, does it fit in our nation's history? Is it as relevant uh, in our past, was it as relevant in, in our past as it is relevant today spurs a lot of questions about it, yes. And, and the whole idea of judicial review. What exactly does that mean? And, and thank you, John, for suggesting, and it's so true that we were able to bring 13 individual nations together when we were colonies to form e pluribus unum by compromises and resolutions on a common concept of union. And therefore, in, in solidifying uh, the, um, uh, the uh, oh, um, Articles of Confederation, and Jefferson thought the articles were fine. He didn't think they needed to be tampered with. I mean, he knew there were weaknesses in general taxation and the method of electing the president. It was that whole idea of the Constitution, which he finally accepted, that helped us pull ourselves closer together, tighter together, and to recognize it needs to be more relevant to the people with a Bill of Rights amended to it. There's Jefferson. Keep this at the forefront of the people, and also that idea of the judiciary and judicial review. That's another unifying fact. So to be able to explain that to folks and helping everyone understand that Marbury versus Madison is as relevant today as it was 200 years ago in further securing judicial review, but are the disagreements any the less that Jefferson had with Marshall, and that's something I think that uh, that helps us better to understand where we are as to where we have been. So, in that better understanding, uh, how ha in in a legal referral in in legally, how has the evolution of judicial review? gone. Where, where are we right now with that legal evolution? Of well, that's sort of important. So we got people's perception, but, but legally, and I think this is critical. And again, I, I started with the point that, that people really should take to heart. The, the concept of judicial review was embedded and they, all of the founders said, we have to have that because how else can you prevent Congress or the executive from interfering with people's rights? And, and Jefferson would say, and, and legitimately, well, Congress should make its own decisions. Sure, but what, when they, what about when they make a decision that violates people's rights? So Jefferson, Madison, Henry Marshall, they all say judicial review. So then has something changed? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And I think the answer is yes. And this is, again, I, I don't think we can project too much for Jefferson, but maybe he saw. And I think there's two things that have fundamentally changed. The one is government is bigger. And, and that's unavoidable. I mean, you can't go back to 18th century government. I mean, we, 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 you've got air traffic control and you've got regulation of pesticides and herbicides and you've got food safety. I mean, so, so as government gets bigger and especially in the 20th century and you have a, a regulatory state, well, suddenly that judicial review might be a bigger deal uh, at this point. And the second thing is, um, the judiciary has changed. The idea of a nationwide injunction, um, the idea of an injunction for that matter at all, um, the idea of a class action, 
These are all expansive ideas. And again, they're important ideas, they're necessary ideas. In a complicated world with over 350 million US citizens, these are things that are gonna have to be. But in the context of judicial review, those, those changes in our world make it much bigger. Now, is that why Jefferson sort of looking ahead says, gee, I, I, you know, yes, I was one of the people saying we need judicial review. He refers, I think, to the term sappers and miners, <laughs> that the judiciary can become sappers and miners against our democracy. And, and he certainly would have seen McCulloch versus Maryland in that way, I think 1819. Now, I think McCulloch versus Maryland is a, is a good case, but the idea of federal power against the states and, and the Supreme Court ruling, and then uh, Dred Scott. Oh, yeah. and, and then you know into the end of the 1890s, um, and separate but equal, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it is a vast power, but it's a power, it's a necessary power, which is what Jefferson and Madison were saying, how else would the court behave? Um, take a half step back, put on my lawyer's hat that, you know, what Marshall says is it is the province of the court to declare what the law is. And when somebody comes to us with a case and they're suing the government or they say, my rights have been violated and my rights have been violated because the Congress has acted unconstitutionally, the president or some agency, the secretary of state has acted unconstitutionally, What's the court supposed to do right. other than judicial review? It's, it's the court's job to say that's a, that law violates the higher law of the Constitution, just the way they would say a regulation violates a statutory law, and we have to use the higher law. So I think that it's, it's this expansion. Um, and, and again, I don't know whether we can say definitively Jefferson saw it coming, uh, but I think, I think that's why it takes on such a broader implication today and you hear it when you talk to folks on the hill and, and john isn't that the point in the case of marbury versus madison there's a violation of the law that that uh the um uh the, the it's called writ to mandamus right. right in in other words that these commissions the commissions that were signed by president adams uh for the new uh, judges uh, to take their chair and begin their work, uh, some of them were not delivered, hand delivered to those judges after they had been signed. So the question is then, well, as Jefferson comes into office, are those uh, commissions valid any longer, Petition, particularly if that Federal Judiciary Act of 1801 is repealed, which they set about yeah. to do, so no matter whether those commissions were not hand delivered, they're, they're not valid anyway any longer. And then the most remarkable, and, and Marshall agrees that, that, that is, it's a good point, but, but should the court then make the decision that they must be hand delivered, that that's the whole point of signing them to hand deliver. So he looks back into that first Federal Judiciary Act of 1789, which has, I don't know how many articles, but the one point is Article 13 says that commissions that are assigned must be delivered. And then Marshall turns around in this remarkable decision himself and says, well, that's against the law. That's unconstitutional. The Federal Judiciary Act of 1789, establishing our nation's systems of courts, establishing our nation's constitution is going a little too far. Yeah, and, and, and the specific thing, I mean, now he, he does gratuitously, and again, lawyers will point out, he says that Madison is violating the law by failing to give Marbury his, his uh, Justice of the Peace license. He didn't really need to say that. That was gratuitous. That may have been a poke. And we'll come, I want to come back to the Jefferson and Marshall individual. That one was a little bit of a poke. And I actually went back and pulled out my copy of the Constitution. Actually, I have about a dozen copies of the Constitution laying around my office. But read it, that, that what he says is the Judiciary Act says that you can bring these writs of mandamus, forcing federal officials to, to take action, directly to the Supreme Court as original jurisdiction. And he says, I'm looking at the Constitution, and Article Three, of the Constitution, lays out very expressly very limited original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. You can have original jurisdiction in a state versus state, or an ambassador versus the government, and that's it. And, and the Constitution's quite clear. That's exclusive. Those are the only, 
Every other case has to come to the Supreme Court from the lower courts. And so what he's, he's saying, you know, you, you've given us power, you've given me power that the Constitution says I don't have. Um, and so he says, no, it's unconstitutional. I'm going to strike it down. And, and in theory, Marbury could have gone back and brought the case again at a lower court and then it appealed it and appealed it. But at that point, as you say, it was going to be irrelevant because the Judiciary Act was being appealed. So Marshall's underlying point that, you know, what am I supposed to do if you, if you Congress, write a law that is inconsistent with the clear terms of the Constitution? I can't enforce that law. Right. Now, as I said, I want, I want to come back to the gratuitous, <laughs> the gratuitous, you know, slap it. So how much of this is personality? Oh, a lot of it's personality. I mean, it's, it's the differences in personality within a family. I, I don't want to say differences in personality within a, 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 a Virginia family, because these are differences that run through the family man, let alone uh, families of um, consanguinity, that is, uh, of the same blood. Uh, Jefferson, the Jefferson family and the Marshall family, as far as their male line, are, uh, go all the way back into the early settlement of the former colony of Virginia. And uh, what is so very interesting is that Thomas Jefferson remarks about his family, the Jeffersons, originally being seated at the foot of Mount Snowden in Wales. So they're, they're Welsh, more or less, that have come into England, and then they come into Jamestown uh, pretty early on. Uh, the Marshall family uh, goes directly back to England, and what is interesting about John Marshall's paternal uh, lineage is, and I don't know how many greats we go back, but uh, the, the one Marshall in England is a supporter of Charles I uh, during the time of Cromwell. So it's fascinating to think that a Marshall male ancestor is very closely tied and supportive of monarchy and, <laughs> and the element of the royal law. What makes it even more interesting is that John Marshall's father is a supporter, as a surveyor in particular, of the Fairfax family and the Fairfax Holdings uh, in Virginia, which of course was a royal grant under Thomas Lord Fairfax of over five million acres. Five million acres, which you know includes all of the Northern Neck and then goes far up into the Northwest to the headwaters of the Potomac and the Rappahannock River, and isn't it interesting that Thomas Jefferson's father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, helps to survey the Fairfax line, that 75-mile line that connects those headwaters to provide for that royal grant. Now, this is what helped, what begins some of the stirrings, mumbling and grumblings of our American Revolution because that's five million acres prohibited to free settlement, free settlement. And so here you have a marshal uh, in the interest of the Fairfax family early on. What is also interesting is that John Marshall's, fa John Marshall's father establishes a, um, a, a family settlement in the wilderness, way up north in the top area of this Fairfax settlement. And um, it's, it, it, John Marshall is born in a log cabin. Here he is born in a log cabin out in the wilderness, up near, uh, uh, well, it's, it's not too far from Alexandria. It's, it's up in that originally Prince William area, and I'm trying to think of the name of Fauquier County, Fauquier County now. Here's Thomas Jefferson that is born and brought up at Shadwell Farm. That, that is of rather um, Virginia gentry uh, holdings and representation. It's a freeholding. Uh, family into which he is born. Now, what then might bring John Marshall and Thomas Jefferson uh, closer together? Their maternal line, their mother's line, because John Marshall and Thomas Jefferson are second cousins. Thomas Jefferson's mother's father and John Marshall's mother's mother are brother and sister. And uh, this John Marshall's family lineage comes through the Thomas Randolph line of Tuckahoe Plantation, which is the same line and the same plantation where Thomas Jefferson's son-in-law, Thomas Mann Randolph Jr., was born and grows up. Now, so there you have immediate contentions uh, that are coming from within their family on the maternal side. What makes this somewhat of a contention? 
because John Marshall's grandmother marries a gentleman who has considered by the Randolph family to be below her station. And that must have been rattling uh, within the family at that time because that uh, John Marshall's grandmother, that woman turns around and marries for a second time a preacher by the name of Reverend James Keith. And the Keith family are well-established, well-known uh, in early uh, colonial Virginia gentry. So here you have from that mother's side, almost uh, John Marshall, a uh, reconciling, uh, but still these kind of uh, mumblings and grumblings and little shakings of something having been amiss uh, in the lineage, whereas in Thomas Jefferson's yes. family, oh, it's all clean and yes. secure and solid. And Jefferson has a wonderful education at William and Mary. John Marshall is not formally schooled. Later, he, he and by the way, John Marshall enlists in the service of our new nation to fight the American Revolution. He is attendant to several battles, particularly the Battle of Brandywine, Jefferson is commissioned a lieutenant colonel with Albemarle Militia, but he never That's sees true. any any battle, any action. Now, just one final thing that makes this even the more of a, of a, of a contention within their, their family lines. Thomas Jefferson, when he is a young man, becomes enamored of a young girl when he goes to Williamsburg by the name of Rebecca Burrell. She's an orphan uh, girl and is brought up uh, by the, um, uh, oh, mercy. A very wealthy orphan girl. A very wealthy orphan girl of, of the Burrell uh, family line, and she's brought up by, uh, oh, she's born at Fairfields, the Burrell Plantation over in Gloucester, and I cannot remember the name of the family who, who brings her up. But in any respect, Jefferson so adores this young girl, he does not want to be ridiculed because it may be that she's not returning his, his uh, uh, affections. So he tries to describe or dis, um, more or less disguise her name in correspondence. He calls her Fair Belinda, my Fair Belinda. He proposes to Rebecca Burrell. She turns him down in that proposal. That's well-known story. Takes place in the Apollo Room in the Raleigh Tavern in Williamsburg. And she turns around and she marries Jacqueline Ambler, who was educated uh, at the uh, um, uh, College of Philadelphia. And they have vast holdings, particularly out of Jamestown Island. Jacqueline Ambler and Mary uh, Burrell Ambler's child, Mary Ambler, I mean, Rebecca Burrell uh, Ambler's child, Mary Ambler, becomes the wife of John Marshall whom he's very devoted to. You know, the point of all this is, you know, we tend to look at these gentlemen as if they're those marble busts you see on the table or you see Mr. Jefferson behind you, that, that um, they're, they're human. And there's a lot of human interaction going on. I, I read one historian who said that Jefferson, who's always, he's difficult with the young women. He's always a little diffident to speak in public when he's a young man. And he looked on Marshall, John Marshall and Patrick Henry, another person Absolutely. he didn't like. It's, it's sort of like the, the captain of the football team with the chief cheerleader, you know, when, when you're a little bit of a recluse. And I, I think one can go too far with that. But the point is there, there are personal things going on here. So part of what's going on with Jefferson's uh, concern with John Marshall really just relates to John Marshall as much as the Supreme Oh, Court. I think so, too. And, and Jefferson's older. Jefferson's what? He's, uh, Jefferson's born in 43. Marshall was born in 1755. So Marshall is pretty much of the age of James Madison. Uh, and both Jefferson and Marshall uh, read law with George okay. Wythe. Now, the interesting thing, Marshall never graduates from William and Mary. He attends to it beginning 1780, so he has a furlough. He's able to leave the service during the American Revolution, enters William and Mary, but he never graduates. Neither does Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Well, that's very common. I, I, was, I was actually talking to some of the guides. People think of these people going to college. Very, very few people who went to college in the 18th century actually graduated. That's right. James that's Madison's right. an exception. Um, and because it was almost a finishing school for rich young men to, to play, but... Um, yeah, so they are studying under George Wythe. So there's a lot of personalities. But to think that they're reading, they're both not, not together because Wythe on, no, no, only different. takes a student for one student for a period of three years. 
but they're reading with George Wythe the foundation of English common law. They're reading uh, ancient Roman jurisprudence that is taught by George Wythe. They're, they're realizing that laws evolve and grow with the experience of every successive generation. That's the foundation of English common law. And to think they're both reading this and hearing it and studying it at the same time, and then once they receive their uh, licenses to practice, they're off in different political directions. And I say that because as Marshall is elected to first the Virginia House of Delegates uh, and then to Congress, he is later brought into the, uh, the coterie of General Alexander Hamilton to formalize opposition to Jefferson and Jeffersonian Republicans. So here's Marshall kind of following through with his own political bent later on uh, to stand formally in opposition uh, to, to Jefferson, a Hamiltonian in well, that regard. And, and, and that election, I mean, I, I oh. hadn't even thought about this before. You think about that election, that John Marshall had been sent to the, uh, as an ambassador on the XYZ affair, yeah trying to get peace with France during the quasi-war with France. Uh, President Adams sends him. He was an up-and-coming legislator in Virginia. Um, and he comes back sort of a hero because they refuse to give France the bribe. Well, this is just when Jefferson is becoming really concerned with the Federalist power, the reign of witches in 1798. Okay. Federalists control the Congress. They control the presidency. Uh, you can be prosecuted for criticizing the president or Congress. George Washington, in retirement asks John Marshall to run for Congress mm -hmm. against a Democratic Republican, against a Jeffersonian, and Marshall does. He wins that election with the assistance of Patrick Henry, yes. who we know Jefferson doesn't like. Um, and he then becomes, so he's a first year congressman, and John Adams appoints him to be Secretary of State because he couldn't find a Secretary of State, and then at the very last minute appoints him to be Supreme Court Justice, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So again, we've, we've probably gone on too long in the personalities, but there's a lot of history and personality at work here. I wonder what Secretary of State John Marshall thought about a former Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, who resigned uh, because of his arguments with the Secretary of the Treasury. It is, it is extraordinary, these personalities that are deeply rooted and find themselves uh, being revealed more so in politics. So with the respect, John, to... Um, to judicial review, how ha, have you seen, or do you consider that there has been a bias uh, with respect to that, that has also been deeply rooted and has evolved into our present day? It, well, that's a very good question. And I think that's probably one that a lot of the listeners are, are very interested in because you know, it's very easy to dislike this Supreme Court decision or that Supreme Court decision. Jefferson obviously thought there was bias going on in his time. And has partisanship, you know, your question partially, has it changed? Has partisanship grown in the court in a way that's dangerous? And at one level, we want justices, we want judges to be above partisanship. We expect that as a lawyer, we want that and we expect that as a citizen, we want that and expect that. But we do know there's partisanship in the way they're appointed. They're appointed by a political official. They're approved by, by a Senate. So some of that's just going to be a reality. Jefferson was very concerned with uh, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase, oh. who would openly campaign for John Adams right. while he was Supreme Court Justice. So I, I, I think we have to recognize that the system is inherently dealing with people who are political and who gain their appointment in political manners. Now, that's not to say that partisanship is okay or that it's unlimited. I think Jefferson would say, I think there's two things going on, both of which Jefferson would agree with, but one of which in particular he was pointed about, and that is that it's the responsibility of Congress and the executive to, to control the judiciary when they uh, are, are exercising excessive power. And, um, one of the modern cases, and again, we won't get into the right or wrong of it per se, but the case was the people have been heavily critical of is, was the case in Maine about private or government dollars being used to fund private um, uh, Christian schools right. in Maine. 
we, we'll have that discussion in some other live stream about what Jefferson <laughs> thought of that policy. But that's not the issue. The, the, the point there was the legislature had funded those vouchers. Well, if the legislature wants to say there's no vouchers for private education, the Supreme Court decision disappears. So this is an example where Jefferson would say, look, it's up to the Congress and the executive to be acting in ways that prevent the judiciary from acting as platonic guardians in, in some kind of you know, uh, uh, overly excessive manner. And if they misact, then it's up for Congress and, and the executive to control them, passing new laws, passing constitutional amendments if necessary. So now, why does that not happen today? Well, we've got a Congress that's deeply divided by partisanship. Mm -hmm. So is the Supreme Court too partisan? Well, maybe if we had a Congress that understood compromise better and was willing to compromise better, maybe they could be more effective at, at the role that Jefferson saw the executive and, and the Congress having in controlling the judiciary. Now, I think there's a second piece of that, and it was at work in the Samuel Chase trial as well, and people can have their own opinions on whether it's at work today. Partisanship and corruption are different things. You can be a partisan and a political partisan. That's not corruption. That's not having conflicts of interest. That's not you know, ruling in cases you shouldn't rule in. In the Samuel Chase trial, I mean, he was acting judge, jury, and executioner mm -hmm. in those Sedition Act cases. People can have their own opinion of the Supreme Court over the last 200 years. But that's a separate matter. That's, it, judicial review is not the problem. Improper judicial ethics can be a problem. And I don't know that judicial review can, can control that. Mm -hmm. uh, or that judicial, as I said, I don't think judicial review is the problem there. Well, but that, that's sticking with judicial review and how it fits with Congress and the executive. You know, we're talking about Jefferson as being a critic of judicial review. Jefferson is often referred to as the architect of American democracy. Maybe that term's not used as much as it used to be, but that was a common term, that Jefferson's the architect of American democracy. And if judicial review is such a central part of that American democracy, that, that three co-equal grants. Like one of the things I point that I've seen written is that Marbury versus Madison actually makes the judiciary co-equal. We like to talk about three co-equal branches, but without judicial review, in fact, they're the weak sister. They don't. They have no power, so they it makes them co-equal. So, what about Jefferson as the architect of democracy, with judicial review being part of it? Do we still think of Jefferson as the architect of democracy? You know, that's such a, a good question. <laughs> I mean, as you know, it waxes and wanes throughout the 200 years of our nation's history. I'm reminded, uh, is a, a James Parton, the author uh, who wrote on Jefferson back in, I think it was the 1890s, turn of the last century, uh, remarks, if, if Jefferson is wrong, America is wrong. If Jefferson is right, America. Uh, is right. So thank heaven we still question that and we still uh, review that in many respects because certainly Jefferson uh, holds uh, everything uh, that we continue to question in his own life, in his own writings. And, and thank heaven we have his writings over what? 22,000 letters for us to come to a better understanding of where we've been that we might continue to question these things where we are right now. We have these references. Um, yes, how can we have American democracy without Jefferson in our history? How can we have American democracy without Alexander Hamilton in our history, without John Marshall in our history, without George Washington, you name them, uh, let alone how can we have American democracy now evolving from what we thought American democracy was 200 years ago, when, if this were 1822, the only one who has a vote is the white male freeholder, 21 years of age or older. And you talk about government growing today. My gosh, in 1822, we had 24 states. It was no longer 13 states. So when you think of American democracy in that context, well, it wasn't really democracy. In many respects, it was simply like an old Roman Republic, an entitled electorate. So to have been able to evolve more into a democratical republic and more purely a democracy is because of where we've been and the evolution uh, through that. So does Jefferson still play a part in that? Yes, I think, in, and he definitely does, and so does uh, all uh, in, in our past. And, and I mean that for respect to, with respect to our population. 
in the past, of whom we were composed as we became a nation. And, uh, and the fact that with continued immigration, uh, we become a more, the more American every day. I, absolutely. No, I, and I, I point out to people that sometimes, I mean, Jefferson, Jefferson had issues. We know that. Uh, I say sometimes Jefferson's sight was limited, but his vision was expansive. So why is it that, you know, the, the, the Black Panthers, according to Thomas Jefferson in the 1960s, women at Seneca Falls in the 1820s, exactly. why is it that over 100 nations, you know, it's those, that vision, those ideas continue to define American democracy. Although, you know, you were quoting James Parton with the, if Jefferson was right, America's yeah. right. James Parton also says a few years earlier, we haven't talked about Aaron Burr. Oh. And J James Parton says that, that America is, is a, and I have to paraphrase, living in a Jefferson vision, but practicing Aaron Burr politics. Ooh. Which was, was if you know, you know, Aaron Burr was a, a you know, mm. open fist uh, politician. He was no. very, uh, very brutal. And so we like to, we like to think of Jefferson, uh, that vision for America. Yeah. But there has been a history of some brutal politics in the midst of all and, that. And, you know, John, so much a part of that vision uh, in what Jefferson wrote and others, particularly of his time with the vision for the future, the earth belongs to the living generation. The earth belongs to the living generation. The dead have no power over us, I think is so necessary yeah. to remind ourselves we are sailing still through uncharted waters. Man has never been here before. Right. And, and to, to specifically the topic of judicial review, I do, people often ask, well, what would the founders say? And of course, that's a complicated question at the best of times. I do think they would be very surprised at the inability to amend the Constitution, the, the, the practical inability to amend the Constitution. If the Supreme Court goes wrong, you amend the Constitution, you fix the problem. That, of course, is much more difficult today than perhaps it was in their day. I mean, if you think about it, the 11th Amendment, the 12th Amendment, that something happened wrong. The 12th Amendment was a judicial about, or the 11th Amendment was about a judicial case. They thought the Supreme Court had acted wrong. They amended the Constitution. 12th Amendment was about the election of 1800. Things didn't work out right. We amend the Constitution. I do think, I do think they would be surprised uh, at the unwillingness to do that, perhaps. Uh, absolutely. I mean, look how long it was before we had that 13th Amendment. Yes, how it, very long that big it was. Gap. Right. And we had that Dred Scott decision yeah. right in the middle yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, so derogatory to what democracy, democracy is all about. So you have, the, you have the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights right away. You have the 11th Amendment. You have the 12th Amendment. So this idea of, and your comment about generational sovereignty, that Jefferson very much believed every generation mm -hmm. needs to make laws for itself. And so, the, you know, the idea that, that if there is something in the Constitution that we, we the people, believe is wrong, Jefferson, fix it, fix it. You know, it's not a problem. You know, it's interesting, John. I'm, I'm be curious about your um, uh, outlook on this. Um, uh, Jefferson writes, I cannot remember whether it's to uh, George Hay or to Spencer Roan, uh, but it's with respect to Marbury versus Madison, that the idea uh, was held by some people that the three branches are go of our government are independent unto him themselves. And he said, if that were so, then our constitution would be felo de se. Is it felo yeah. de se? It would be an act of suicide. Oh. I, I, I'm not familiar with the letter, but, but I'm not surprised. Because they can't be totally free and independent of one and the other. There has to be a, a interaction amongst them. Well, and that's why I said Jefferson always supported the concept of judicial review. Now, again, is he seeing that it may be expansive and that maybe the government's going to get bigger and the government's going to be doing things he doesn't like and, it's, and, and you know, there needs to be more constraints on it? Yes, but of course there's going to be interaction. Well, we're going to run out of time if we keep talking too. We'll sit here and talk all afternoon. Well, this is what we do, happily. This is what we do here at uh, ICJS, uh, connected with the Monticello Foundation, the International Center uh, for Jefferson Studies. And I want you to know what a privilege it is to have this opportunity uh, as an historic interpreter. That, that's my job here uh, in the persona of Thomas Jefferson, to be able to speak with uh, to help validate and, and to support uh, my work with a historian. I'm curious, John, um, I mean, you've been with the, the foundation, such an integral part of, of what Monticello does. How do you see 
historical interpretation working with our historians as a value and, yeah. and oh that's a great but, question and it, it's, it's it's an important issue you know we talk about public history which is is simply trying to make sure the public hears history um academic historians there are academic historians we all know who sometimes write in a way that mere mortals can't really read and understand <laughs> and they write in an academic gobbledygook what's it matter if we can't talk with people if we can't communicate. And so we're all part of that. The guides at Monticello do a fabulous job. I have the privilege of seeing Bill with the, with the, you know, the public gathered around him listening. Bill does a phenomenal job as Thomas Jefferson, those who haven't seen him. So historical interpretation is just another means of uh, communicating, of, of, of getting people interested in that public history. But we also, I think at Monticello, and I think good public historians everywhere, we understand our different roles. I'll oftentimes be asked a question, and I'll say, that's a guide question. I mean, you know, I have a PhD in history, and if you want to talk about the 18th century and, and enlightenment thought, and what were the forces at work in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And well, I do Bill, frequently Bill, want Bill to talk about Bill will come and, and ask me, <laughs> but if you want to know, well, wait a minute, I, I, we were asking just before the film started, you know, I know Jefferson wrote a letter about this. Bill is going to be more familiar with, oh, yes, that was a letter to James Madison in the 1790s. If you want to know about the house, we were talking about these chairs are low. Well, yeah. why were chairs in the 18th century low? That's a material culture question. The guides are much more. So, you know, I, I, I'm, and it's, I know some academic historians don't like historic interpreters or Colonial Williamsburg or this play acting. I, I think it's very important. I think it's a wonderful thing. I, I do think there's an obligation on the public to understand the difference between a house guide, a historic interpreter, and a, a historian, and somebody who spends their time studying history and, and understanding it. Uh, so we have to, you know, it's what we love to call critical thinking skills today. You know, we have to understand uh, the different roles those people play. But um, there's, in my mind, I, I, Bill knows I'm a huge fan of Colonial Williamsburg, and, and I think these things can be done well. They can be done poorly. But when they are done well, and as I said, Bill does a very good job, it's a way to tell people, you know, this history is real. It's real people um, that were engaged in it, and, and it's very interesting. Well, let me then ask you, as a historic interpreter who's, who's engaged on a daily basis with that public, what do you want the public to take from your talks? To be able to read the history. To, to be able to question as we are talking, as the public and Mr. Jefferson are having a conversation, oh, come on, is this so? Did it really happen? Uh, did Mr. Jefferson actually write that? Did he say that? Is this what he really felt about someone else? Is this how someone else really felt about him? To be able to inspire them to read and seek out the historians to find this as fact. Indeed, it's fact. We live in such times, where has it come from, questioning Fact, I'm going to be blunt upon the subject. Remember what John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. things. They are stubborn things. And, and to be able to reassert what we all do, to be able to reassert the founding principles of our nation and to remind ourselves what a remarkable nation it is in, in human history is, is what it all about, is about. It makes us proud to be Americans. And this is what history helps us better understand, to know where we've been. And oftentimes I'm saying, well, I beg your pardon, I may not know that, but I can point the way to our historians who do, and here are their names, and here are their offices, and their email connections, and turn them into your direction. So uh, I think we all work well together. Uh, the three branches of administration of Monticello, of the public history out in front of our uh, uh, visitors, uh, be them the guides or in personas, Mr. Jefferson, and our historians cannot be independent. And, and this thing, we all work together. Well, that's public history. And you, you quote Adams. What about Jeff Truth will out. I mean, Jefferson out. believes truth will out. But Jefferson, and, and for those of us, those that are watching or will see this, he also believed there's some obligation in that regard. That's why he believes so heavily in public education. The truth will out if the public, if the electorate educates itself and reads the sources and, and goes beyond their own narrow uh, vision. Uh, Jefferson is a great optimist. 
in, in that regard, but it does come with some obligation on the part of the citizen. And he expected that. He thought yes, he that, was, th th that was a given, that people have an obligation as citizens. Well, we've been talking for some time. Bill, it's always a pleasure, and I want to thank all of those folks who've tuned in. Uh, but this has been a live stream from the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies, and we hope you'll join us again for the next live stream. Thank you so Terrific. much. Terrific. <laughs> Bye.